All right. Uh, so today we're supposed to uh, discuss about uh, the easiest uh, sort of uh, type of surrogate modeling, you know, uh, based on uh, uh, polynomial linear regression. Uh, now I have to admit that those who took the course in uh, in the spring or last year, they maybe feel bored. So. Uh, we have only two options. One is to go a little bit faster, and another option is to throw some questions to those who think they know everything, uh, just to justify the lecture today, all right? Or both. OK, uh, but I think you know, in, in some way or another, you have seen most of this material somewhere, even if not in statistics classes, OK? But I'm going to try to, um, to be as informative as possible, but we have to go a little bit faster. We're going to cover less topics in the context of regression than we did uh, last semester. Okay, so there is way more that I will not be able to cover. But we have to sort of uh, go through this because there's no way we can talk about more advanced uh, uh, supervised learning problems unless we do linear regression. Okay, so uh, I'm going to, in the process of jumping things, I'm going to go directly to uh, this slide. So what's the problem? So the problem is somebody gives you, uh, these are x coordinates, uh, the y coordinates here, uh, I follow the notation from Bishop, he calls this t, target value if you like. So these are, uh, this curve that you see here is the generating curve. So you can think that I give you this uh, equation for this curve and you select a few x points and you put some noise to the exact values, and this is uh, what you see there. So these are the training points, and the idea is we would like to uh, be able to do predictions for arbitrary axis to say what the target value t is. All right, and obviously we're eventually, uh, mainly on Thursday, we're gonna have to do this in a fully Bayesian setting, but you can think right now uh, that somehow you're trying to fit a curve that looks like this, it involves polynomials, monomials in X up to a power M, okay? And uh, so effectively, we're gonna have to compute those coefficients, okay? So I'm gonna try sort of to transition from the deterministic approaches to, to stochastic approaches uh, uh, slowly. So right now, basically, this would be a nice, um, uh, you know, uh, how did we call this on decision making? So this is our um, estimate, if you like, of the exact target values t, okay? This is what I call when we did decision, this is uh, the, regression, uh, uh, the regression curve. All right, so the uh, obvious thing to do is to set this mean square error at the training points and compute the w's so that you minimize the error that you see in the equations on the on equation in the middle. So this is uh, your standard sort of least squares problem, okay? You're saying find the w's so that you minimize the mean square error there at the target values x and t n. And uh, again, I remind you, this is the w that I, uh, I decided to use for my model. So you're gonna plug in this w here take derivatives with respect to each of the coefficients w, you set them to zero, and then you get a linear system of equations that you have to believe me, um, in uh, two lines of calculations, basically the linear system of equations looks like that, okay? So uh, this uh, coefficients aij, it comes here to be summation of the training points of xn to i plus j, and again, xn are the axes at the training points and Tn are the corresponding target values. All right, so uh, if you do this uh, and uh, you say, okay, let me fit first a straight line, so M equal to zero, okay? So you only have the bias term W zero in your regression function, you get something like that. Again, uh, not satisfying. Uh, if you put a straight line, you get something like that. If you put uh, M equal to three, you get something like that. And if you put M equal to nine, uh, you overfit. And remember, uh, the objective is not really to fit a curve to the training data points, but somehow to be able to do predictions 
at arbitrary x locations. So in some sense, you can see maybe the training error here is exactly 0, but the test error, if we try to predict what the value of x would be, let's say, at this location, obviously it's not going to be up there. It's going to be down here, right? So we're going to have a problem. So immediately we can see that least squares uh, overfit. Now, this overfitting problem, it goes hand to hand uh, with maximum likelihood estimation. So we're going to try to make uh, a link of the two topics uh, as we go along. Uh, if you want, uh, I think in the first lecture, maybe when we're talking about the basics of machine learning, I gave you uh, plots that look like this. So what I have here is I have some normalized version of the error. So I divide by n uh, these number of training points. And, um, uh, and I take square root so that basically the error here is of the order of the units of the target values t. Okay? You can do something else, but this is what, how I define the error uh, at this point. And what we do is we plot the error for different orders of polynomial for uh, the training data and, and a bunch of testing data. Okay? Testing data is to verify if the algorithm has any predictive capability. And immediately you can see that uh, both errors are relatively high for uh, low complexity models. Then for some intermediate complexities, uh, you basically get some saturation. The error looks uh, uh, decent. And then suddenly, uh, the uh, testing error blows up all right, as, as, uh, uh, as the, uh, now I don't understand why is that the case. Um, huh? Yeah, but uh, soon uh, be this go to zero, yes. right? So uh, you guys, you may want to uh, check it for me. Maybe it's a plotting mistake, right? But certainly the testing error, all right, the testing error, um, uh, the testing error blows up. Okay. So uh, the idea, of course, as we already know, with uh, selecting more than complexity here, is without having to do this uh, type of plots necessarily, which are uh, non-Bayesian in some sense, to figure out what orders of polynomial are appropriate for the complexity uh, of the problem at hand. And as I will uh, discuss today, the complexity of the problem is not defined by your data. So it's not like here are the data, figure out what is the complexity. The complexity is what it is, because the data were generated from some nonlinear function we don't want, we don't know, right? So that function defines what the complexity is, not necessarily the data. So we don't, you know, we should not have the data tell us what the uh, order of complexity for the model is. All right. Um, something else you will, uh, uh, and you can observe this in your homework, uh, when. Uh, uh, you start using higher orders of polynomials, right? And if you do these squares, you suddenly see uh, the coefficients w uh, oscillating between very uh, high positive numbers and very high uh, or very low negative uh, values. So these coefficients are uh, multiplied here by 10 to the 6. So you get an oscillation of the solution. That's why things were looking uh, like this, right? Up and down, up and down. Um, so, uh, so this is basically a fundamental problem uh, related with uh, uh, overfitting and maximum likelihood estimation in least squares. And um, uh, obviously, really what you do here is you fit to the noise of the data rather than to the data itself. So this is not very good. Now, um, so if... Uh, uh, let me see uh, how many data points we use on this. Uh, does it say somewhere? Well, how many points we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten points, okay? Now, the same problem, if we repeat it, but we have 15 points, and the order of polynomial is nine, where we had overfitting, suddenly you see the overfitting, it doesn't seem to be a serious issue, right? Suddenly you had a lot more data, all right? And, and uh, this, uh, this course tells you, you know what? I can afford the higher complexity, not an issue, all right? 
But you know, as I said, the, this is sort of not a good idea to have the data tell you what the complexity of the model is, because the complexity of the model is really driven by this function, which we don't uh, uh, know. Right? This is the generating mechanism of the data. So uh, adjusting the complexity and being able to afford the higher order polynomial just because we have more data, sort of it's a very, uh, it's a little bit suspicious. And uh, you can uh, imagine, I think the next uh, plot has even um, 100 uh, data points. There's zero overfitting, right? This is fantastic. I mean, if somehow you have all of these points, you can do wonderful predictions, actually, OK? Um, but again, this is not uh, what we want to do. So um, can you remind me now why? Uh, so uh, when, uh, you know, we're not going to do Bayesian things uh, uh, at least for uh, most of the lecture today. But can you imagine uh, why this issue uh, of overfitting uh, does not why it does not appear in a Bayesian setting. For example, in a Bayesian setting, you can have hundreds of parameters, but very few data. But that's not an issue. And I mentioned this. Why is that the case? Well, I mean, when you do predictions, right? You don't really care in Bayesian setting about the coefficients. The coefficients is an intermediate uh, uh, tool. When you do predictions, what do you do with the coefficients? You integrate them out, right? So yes, you can have thousands of coefficients with very few data. It's not a problem because they're averaged. You integrate them out, OK? So, uh, so this would not be uh, an issue with, uh, in a Bayesian setting. All right, so the people who do uh, least squares, right, they say, OK, we have to do something to get rid of these oscillations that we get uh, when uh, we try to use higher order polynomials, the oscillations in the coefficients w. And the way they do this is using uh, Tikhonov regularization, which you see it here. Uh, effectively, what it says, you know what? Yes, I, this is what I want to minimize. That's my objective. But can I also uh, not allow the coefficients to vary in, uh, to, uh, you know, not allow the coefficient magnitude basically to be very high. You can add other things here if you want. And actually, um, you may have seen in other settings in machine learning, you may use gradients and uh, other good norms. But this is the simplest form. You say, minimize the error, but don't allow the coefficients to be very high in magnitude, OK? Which is what we observed. Uh, uh, when uh, we did these squares. So lambda is called a regularization parameter. It's not a penalty number. There's a big difference here, right? Penalty number, you try to enforce a constraint. Here, lambda is not going to be a big number. As a matter of fact, lambda can be 10 to the minus 10. Extremely small, right? Extremely small number. So the, and I am not going to tell you uh, how to select lambda because, again, it's not very relevant to this course, but you can imagine at the end of the day, uh, if you want to do predictions and you have a testing set, you want somehow to uh, figure out what is the optimal lambda uh, to uh, give you the best predictive capability for the model. Okay, but there are uh, other ways to do this in, in for uh, you know in the context of regularization. There are many other methods that will allow you to select lambda. So if you uh, so this is norm, right? So it's W transpose W. W is a vector of all the coefficients. So if you plug in the polynomials that we had in the regression function, you take derivatives with respect to the coefficients, um, set them equal to 0. You basically get a similar linear square uh, system of equations. The only difference is basically, you notice, that in the diagonal of so you basically get a metric A times W equals some vector B. Uh, the only difference is that in the diagonal of the matrix A, uh, you add uh, plus lambda, right? And some of you may have, uh, uh, like myself when I was young and immature, all right, when something, a matrix was not very well posed, I would go and just uh, by myself, just say add 10 to the minus 20, just in case the system is invertible. And that's what happens, OK? So if you add a little bit in the diagonal, somehow you can you know, uh, 
uh, you get a stable solution, all right? And it works, all right? Literally, it works. Now, you may say, well, uh, uh, are you really solving the, the real problem? Yes, you do. Okay, so, um, all right? So let's see what happens now if uh, we do this thing with regularization. So we're going to put different orders of regularization. Uh, so the, uh, the values that I give you for lambda, so this should be a Greek lambda. OK, so I need to correct it. Uh, so the, this is e to the minus 18, right? It's a very small regularization. And you notice uh, there is no oscillation. So this is. Uh, this is the original sign curve that generates the data, and now you can see, uh, uh, you know, uh, the fitting curve that I get looks very nice. Okay, there is no oscillations that I had before, so the over overfitting has disappeared. Uh, if you use now um, very high regularization, what happens? So look, if you look at this equation, and lambda is very high, what is going to happen? You put lambda a huge number equal to one, for example. What's going to do to all the coefficients? I mean, you remember you try to minimize this. So if you put lambda a big number, the only way this can be minimized is when when the w is a zero. All right. And if the w is a zero, really the only thing that you are left is uh, the bias term. Uh, and uh, so, you know, in this case, you almost get, um, you know, you get basically, for this particular value, you get basically like a straight line, okay? I'm going to come back to regularization of the bias term as we go along because that's uh, sort of uh, an interesting little detail that is missing from uh, being discussed explicitly in books. But uh, so here, lots of the coefficients dropped and, uh, and, and uh, you get a model of very low complexity. Uh, so if you plot things versus the regularization parameter or the log of the regularization parameter, uh, uh, basically um, the, you know, you get again some asymptotic values like that. So the tricky here is, the trick is there is no one lambda that does the job, right? It's a whole range of lambdas, all right? It's a whole range of lambdas that somehow they give you more or less the same values for both the training and, and the uh, test error. All right. So um, obviously, in a Bayesian setting, right, we uh, need to uh, bring some prior information, OK? And, uh, and in particular, you need some prior information in regions you don't have any data. So for example, if your data is here, you have a lot and you have some data there, but there's nothing in there. How do you expect, you know, if you have some polynomial, how do you expect the polynomial to be able to capture anything when there is no data in, uh, in, uh, in that domain? So the only way to do this is uh, to sort of start thinking in, a, in a, a, a probabilistic way. So effectively what we're going to do is we're going to assume that this coefficients W are random variables. All right. So we're going when we say we're going to be doing predictions. We still have our regression function, the polynomial. But if the w's are random variables, then effectively at every x the prediction will be a distribution. Okay, and that distribution, that uncertainty, would be introduced uh, by having uncertainty basically in um, uh, in the w values, and also you know we would be accounting for the noise. Uh, uh, in the training data. Now, you know what? If, you, um, if you're not a Bayesian person uh, and people do uh, linear regression models in uh, statistics with a non-Bayesian setting, they still consider that the predictions are probabilistic. As a matter of fact, you know, if you look standard textbooks on statistical learning that they don't have anything Bayesian on them, still very good books, they plot error bounds and all of these things. From where is the uncertainty coming in those standard statistical methods? So when they say, you know, uh, for a particular location, the uncertainty, you know, it's this mean plus minus this error bars. Where do the error bars come? Because in standard statistics, 
they're not going to assume a prior model for w. They're not going to make the coefficients w random variables. No, the coefficients are going to be deterministic. So where is the uncertainty coming in the standard models? And standard, I mean, you know, in the context of frequentist uh, statistics. It's uncertainty over what? Over the observations, over the training data set. So in a Bayesian setting, there is one training data set, right? And you figure out what's going on using only that data set. In frequent statistics, you're basically trying to see how uh, different training data give you different observations. And from that, you make basically some statistical decisions about error bars and things like that, OK? So very much different from what you will see um, uh, in the lecture today and certainly on Thursday, we are going to play with only one data set, not a collection of data sets trying to, to, to do statistics. So uh, this slide basically summarizes this frequentist and, and the Bayesian approach. So I want you to keep this, uh, these things in mind. So, in, um, um, so I can start, you know, even though we will do the Bayesian setting on, on, uh, uh, on Thursday, uh, to a significant extent. I wanted to start throwing uh, ideas on, as to what exactly we will do. So we will uh, assume a regression function, exactly like what I had before. Uh, but we're going to take the coefficients w to be random variables. And we're going to compute, given some set of training data that I denote here as d, we're going to compute the posterior of the parameters. So what you see here is Bayer's rule saying the posterior of the parameters is the likelihood. Right? Obviously, if you knew the parameters and you have a polynomial, right, you can go and compute what the likelihood is. That would be mainly induced by the noise in, in uh, your model. Your model would be basically whatever polynomial function plus some Gaussian noise. So that would define the likelihood times the prior. And then, of course, we have uh, the model evidence that you see uh, here in the standard way. Uh, so let me. Uh, you know, so in the context of Bayesian setting, right, we discuss least squares. Uh, so uh, let me bring maximum likelihood estimation. And again, I will not be able to spend lots of time, but I want to communicate here the message that uh, maximum likelihood estimation has exactly the same problems uh, as least squares. Not actually exactly the same problems, the same identical problem. Okay? They are basically both the same. So what I want to do is I want to um, show you a least squares sort of uh, MLE issue of uh, overfitting by taking simple Gaussian, OK? So we're going to take that both parameters mu and sigma square are the unknown parameters here. So we have a collection of data. I write the likelihood like that. Take the log of that, expand the, the exponentials, right? And you get basically a log likelihood that looks like that. So can you immediately see that um, this looks like a mean square error, right? This is identical to what we did with these squares. So if you really want to compute this, right? I mean, the problem here is, of course, to compute both mu and sigma square. But you can see here, uh, this is uh, a mean square error, OK? So when you take derivatives with respect to mu and sigma square, uh, this is what you get. And this, we already have used them, actually, assuming that you already have seen this before. This is the MLE estimate for a Gaussian. This comes to be the sample mean. And this comes to be the sample variance. OK? Uh, the issue that we would see, I think, on the next slide is that the variance that you use to define the MLE estimate for sigma square, it's actually uh, the MLE, uh, MLE mean, all right? The sample mean. It's not the exact, the exact value. All right? Um, so uh, let me show you actually uh, 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 an issue with uh, this very nice uh, plot here. Imagine you have two data sets, right? And you're trying to compute the mean and the variance of a Gaussian with uh, uh, MLE estimates, OK? So this is the true Gaussian from where the two data points come from, right? So, so in this case, the two data points are here. In this case, they're there. In this case, they're there. So obviously, you can see the mean is going to be somewhere there. The variance is around there. So you know this is the MLE estimate. So if you fit 
mu and sigma square, this is the Gaussian that you get. Has nothing to do with the true Gaussian. Similarly here, if you fit uh, the MLE estimates on a Gaussian, you get something like that, way up, away from the true Gaussian. And in this case, it looks like that. Now, if you take the mean of the three Gaussians and, and if you take the average, I believe that should look very good close to the exact mean. What do you think? Right? I mean, you know, uh, this plus this plus that should give you basically the mean of the two gaps, approximately. But if you take the variance, what do you see? So even if you repeat this with three data sets and you uh, take the average of the variance, uh, what estimate do you get? You get bigger than the, uh, the exact variance, less? Less? All right, so basically you underestimate the variance, right? And that is uh, the uh, issue with maximum likelihood, and that's the issue with uh, uh, least squares. Now, um, so uh, if you, so these are the estimates that we had for the mean and the variance. So if you try to be a frequentist for a second, right? And you say, look, because x comes from a distribution, all right, uh, these estimates are really um, uh, uh, random variables themselves. Because if I have different data sets, right, I will be getting different values. So what uh, happens is, if you take the expectation of the two equations with respect to the underlying distribution from where the data come, you can immediately see that the expectation of each of the x's is mu, right? So you have mu times n divided by n, you get mu. So the estimate for the mean is unbiased. That's what the definition of unbiased means. And if you do the same thing for the variance, so if you expand this, you put xi squared minus 2 times xi mu plus mu squared, and then you try to take expectations using uh, these nice properties that you see uh, here. OK? Uh, all right, so if you use those two. Uh, equations there, then you come up that the expectation for the variance is not actually the true variance. So the uh, the estimate, the MLE estimate here is biased. Okay? And one way to make it an unbiased estimate, we may already have seen this somewhere in an earlier lecture or we will see it shortly today or, or on Thursday. So if you, so this is what you get, right? The, the, the MLE estimate comes to be biased so what is the, a, a trivial way to correct this that statisticians use? Instead of taking this as the MLE estimate, they modify it as what? So what they use is instead of 1 over n, they use 1 over n minus 1. All right? So if you use 1 over n minus 1, the variance of that estimate, you multiply this by n over n, all right, and using this, okay, so uh, one of the n's will cancel, one of the n minus ones will cancel, and then it will give you the exact values, okay? And the important thing here is, I don't know if the next slide has this equation. No, it does not. So uh, if you put one over n minus one, the idea here is, that one degree of freedom has already been used to uh, fix the MLE estimate for the mean, all right? Uh, so in, uh, in some ways, that, that n minus 1, that 1, is the effective number of parameters in your problem. And when we will uh, discuss about uh, parameter selection uh, for regression models and other things, you will see that you will be getting a similar thing like 1 over n minus something, and that something will be defining the effective number of parameters in your model. OK? So again, uh, for now, this is unbiased. If you want to make this unbiased, you have to put 1 over n minus 1. If n is big, it doesn't make a difference. But if n is very small sample, yes, it does make a difference. All right, I am uh, bypassing a few things here and there, right? Again, these are, in many ways, a review. Uh, 
So I have uh, already, when we discuss about decision problems, right? The idea here is um, this is the regression function, okay? And um, uh, we already have seen, right, that the optimal regression function that minimizes a quadratic loss function is really the expectation of t given x. And remember, this is a very fundamental thing related with quadratic losses. Uh, and it doesn't matter what the details of the model, this is very powerful, OK? So basically, uh, the idea here is there is some distribution for every x. There is a distribution of t. The mean of that distribution defines the regression function, OK? So uh, and this is how we're going to treat this in a Bayesian setting. We will uh, somehow try to compute uh, the details of this distribution, all right? And, and, uh, and then uh, use this information to, uh, to be able to do predictions. All right, so let me, um, let me see where this is going to take us before I say anything. Okay, so this is about basis functions. So uh, think of a problem in d dimensions, okay? Uh, so uh, my regression function is some bias term plus uh, w1x1, wdxd, okay? So again, x1, xd are my coordinates in, uh, in my d dimensions, okay? We call this problem, by the way, linear regression problem, not because it's linear in the x's, but, you know, uh, it's linear in the parameters, okay? As a matter of fact, we will uh, shortly be able to generalize, and instead of using simple x's, we can use anything we want to. We can use any functions of x's, okay? Uh, and here it is actually a generalization of this. Uh, the, uh, if instead of using, uh, you know, x1 or xd, you know, x, this bold x is the vector x, right? You can use uh, some basis function of x and another basis function of x. So really your model, your regression function is w transpose phi of x, okay? Phi again is some function uh, that you define a priori that you want to use. Uh, can be polynomials, can be sines, can be cosines, can be, you know, uh, wavelets, uh, splines, or anything else you want. Uh, the, uh, this coefficient here is called the bias term. And uh, let me just, um, uh, I don't know why there is a loose x there. All right, so this x was left alone here, okay? Uh, miserable alone. Uh, so let me say something uh, that is going to come up a little bit uh, later in the lecture. Uh, this coefficient here, w0, sort of uh, uh, can be treated by dumping it in the same format as the rest of the coefficients that multiply basis functions by saying, you know what, I'm going to multiply this with a function phi0 of x that's equal to 1, okay? So that's sort of, it puts everything under one roof including the bias term. But somehow, there is a pathology there that later on when we put a prior model on W, uh, that implicitly will also imply that we're going to have a prior uh, on W0, and that's bad for you, because usually you don't regularize the, uh, the bias term. So uh, later on, we will see we will still sort of use the same form, but we will need to do something to get rid of w0 so we don't treat it the same way as the rest of the, of the coefficients. So uh, I think in uh, one of the common problems we insert the equation where effectively you will have to repeat your calculations where you do things like this, where this basis function is one, but then you do something else and we will discuss it where you compute this w0 as post-processing operation, okay? Um, so keep in mind that maybe we would need to do something special on W0. So what these functions uh, can be, can be anything, uh, but uh, the recommendation here, uh, and this is sort of a rule, these functions need to have local support, okay? You cannot go and use Lagrange polynomials or something like that, right? Those you learn when you take math courses, uh, they, they have nice properties, they're eigenfunctions of operators and all of these things, but in the context of machine learning, they are not very useful. We want things of local support. Uh, so for example, you can see here you have a Gaussian uh, basis functions. And all of them are basically non-zero uh, around mu on a spread that is defined by this variance s squared. 
Uh, what we're going to do uh, in the lectures this uh, week, when you write this basis functions, we're going to assume that you already have defined what mu and s uh, square is going to be, right? If you want really to be proper and up to date on this game, you should not assume anything, all right? Because how do you really know that this is the best choice, okay? So, but right now we are assuming that the basis functions are well defined. Uh, the, we will, uh, I think, devote a whole week on adaptive basis functions near the end of this, uh, the semester, but right now mu and s squared are defined. You can use sigmoid functions, they look like this, okay? Uh, very popular and I give you fundamental equations for the sigmoid function. You may want to actually look at them carefully because we will use those for logistic re regression uh, in, a, in a few lectures, all right? Uh, so the uh, logistics uh, uh, function is one divided by one plus e to the minus alpha, and it is related with the uh, hyperbolic tangent uh, function as well. So uh, if you have uh, representation in terms of sigmoids, you can also write it uh, in a straight manner as a representation in terms of tangent. But you know these uh, sigmoids is, is uh, the, 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 a, more, a much more common uh, sort of way to write this type of things. Okay. So, uh, we talked about the regression function, uh, and uh, we said that uh, the uh, best solution is the expectation uh, of t for a given x. So let's put all of these things in uh, some probabilistic setting, and the equations that I would like to introduce today to start with are these three simple equations. I am going to assume that at every x, the response is basically the regression function that we have seen before, plus some noise that I make it Gaussian. That's all. All right? So basically, the, you know, this is the, this red curve is the regression function, right? It is really the, the in this case, is the mean of the response, as you can see, because I use mean for the Gaussian noise. And uh, so uh, y equals P plus force W, and then you add some noise to that, okay? And, and uh, that's our model. And now you see the reason why, uh, for example, in Bishop's book, he distinguishes between y and t, right? Uh, the idea here is uh, t is the target, all right? y is the regression function, y of x. I mean, if, if, you put, if you call this y, then you would have to call this something else, OK? And again, different books use different notations, so try not to get uh, 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 lost because notation is unimportant. So if you uh, look at this equation, you can immediately see that really the equation that is going to drive the likelihood model is this, right? So the distribution of the target given uh, an input x, given the, the weights w and the noise beta, is uh, Gaussian centered around this value, right, the regression function, with a noise beta minus 1, right? As a matter of fact, you can, you know, you don't even have to write this. You can just directly say, this is my likelihood model. So if I knew the parameters, this is my regression function. Actually, you can use this as a definition, if you like, and you put some noise. But, you know, sort of all of these are coming from this uh, little three equations, OK? But you may see them later on just directly as this nice equation. So again, this is. If we knew W, all right? If we knew W. All right, so, uh, so we introduce sort of, uh, there's nothing Bayesian yet, right? We introduce some uh, probabilistic model, we introduce this regression function and uh, some noise model. And uh, we have seen from uh, the lectures on decision making uh, that uh, the regression function basically minimizes the uh, L2 error from the target values. So let's do the following thing. Let's uh, assume we have a bunch of data. So the data are all these uh, blue dots, all right? And uh, so, uh, so I'm going to write my lucky groups. Uh, so I collect this data identically, you know, IID data. So I can write the likelihood as the product of these Gaussians at the different locations of XM, right? Nothing fancy. And then what you do is, you, uh, we're going to try to do uh, a maximum uh, likelihood estimation 
of the parameters w to see what, what comes out of it. Okay, so we're going to try to compute the MLE of w. And uh, so I take the logs of that. There are exponentials there, and there's a product, so these exponentials will become summation. Uh, would you agree with me? Because this has a, a, a precision beta, all right? So you're gonna get, from the exponentials, you're gonna get minus beta over two summation of this, okay? From the normalization term, you're gonna get that, uh, times n, because I have n data points, and there's another constant term, okay? So if somebody tells you to compute the MLE estimate and you look at this equation, all right? So the MLE estimate for W is the W value that <coughs> maximizes this. But maximizing that, isn't it equivalent to what? There's a minus sign there. It's equivalent to what? <coughs> Minimizing that square error, which is least squares, which has all the pathologies we discussed. Okay, so that's not a surprise, okay? So the MLE estimate is basically uh, the same as uh, ordinary least squares. <coughs> of course here, uh, the noise is also unknown, so you're gonna have to compute uh, uh, an MLE estimate for the noise. So I will show you what, uh, if you take derivatives with respect to beta, you're gonna get a contribution from here, a contribution from there. So I'm gonna give you what the values are. So actually, uh, this is the MLE estimate, is the W that minimizes this uh, mean square error. And uh, the MLE estimate for beta, it actually looks like a sample uh, variance, all right? Um, uh, so it's the variance of the predictions of the uh, uh, regression function computed at the MLE values of W from the target values. So in many ways, you know, you, you know, this is, uh, again, it looks like uh, you computed the variance, which we know is biased uh, for a Gaussian, all right? So it's slightly different, but the formula looks identical. And the only difference, again, is notice that there is a plug-in approximation here, right? Because we do all of these calculations at MLE. So when we compute uh, beta at the MLE uh, point, the W here is the MLE W. So you plug in here whatever polynomials or sigmoid functions you had assumed. You do the minimization with W. That will give you the WMLE. So this is the beta MLE, all right? And uh, if you don't want to be Bayesian, what actually you can do is you can say, you know what? I am done, OK? I did my MLE. I did my job. So can I now do probabilistic uh, calculations? And the answer is yes, you can. And the easiest thing you can do is you can use the plug-in approximation, where effectively, you know what you're going to do is you're going to assume the likelihood model. But uh, everywhere, instead of W and beta, you're going to put their uh, MLE estimates. All right? So you remember the likelihood estimate is if you knew W, if you knew beta, what's the probability of T at a given location x? And you remember the mean was the regression function, the precision was beta. Fine, so since you now have point estimates, you plug them in, and that would be the obvious sort of probabilistic uh, 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 things you can do. So in uh, this plot here, right? So what you can, uh, uh, so this is the distribution of the alternative location. If you knew W and if you knew beta, so what you do is, you say, yes, W is my WMLE, beta is my beta MLE, so that's my distribution now, okay? Nothing Bayesian, but you know somebody can say, "Well, I'm doing probability." All right. So, uh, and um, uh, in the slides you will see a lot of uh, little uh, uh, MATLAB libraries that allow you to play with basis functions and and compute MLE things. So, uh, this is just basically computing the the MLE estimates for uh, different type of. Uh, uh, regression functions in uh, two dimensions. So if you want, you can play with that. Um, all right, so uh, so we can, uh, obviously, so, you know, uh, you know, you can uh, uh, repeat all of these things for uh, basis functions phi, right, and write them explicitly. And actually, let me see if I'm, if, uh, I'm going to give you now or later the exact equations uh, in terms of the design metrics. 
I think it's coming in like two slides, okay? So, um, so this is the, uh, the uh, so capital X here, the notation is the collection of all my input points. When you see ball T is right, the response is at all the uh, training data. So this is the likelihood, all right? This is the log likelihood, that's what we had before, okay? And um, the least squares problem uh, is the same basically as um, uh, minimizing the negative log likelihood. So you will often see NLL, right? So this needs to be maximized, all right? If you put a minus sign, uh, this needs to be minimized, and this becomes basically ordinary least squares. And um, um, there is really nothing uh, uh, I can tell you here. It's just, um, you know, uh, so the a negative log likelihood, it's, uh, um, say here it's a quadratic ball basically with a unique uh, uh, minimum and actually uh, it's wonderful that uh, the, uh, this quadratic function has a unique minimum and it has a unique minimum because of convexity okay uh, so uh, otherwise if there were multiple MLE estimates would have been uh, in, uh, in uh, trouble so here you can um, I think somewhere in the slides Basically, there is a discussion about the uniqueness of the, the MLE estimate, I believe. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to uh, write now these equations in a compact uh, algebraic form uh, so we can see how things, uh, how the algebra looks like. All right, so this is, uh, uh, the calculation looks a little bit tedious, but the dirty work of uh, summarizing them down and correcting them and recorrecting them has been done. Um, and uh, so you guys can enjoy these equations. So the uh, log likelihood looks like this, and this is the mean square error, all right? And um, I don't remember now what all the subscripts mean. What is the subscript D means there? Why bishop gives the D? Must be a reason for everything in life, right? Data, training data maybe, all right, okay. So, so it's the mean, basically this is what you get, right? And I want, you know, he summarizes this mean square error of the training data with uh, E of D, and it's a function of W, okay? And you notice again, the regression function is W transpose phi, okay? Uh, where each function phi is computed at Excel. Phi is a vector, W is a vector. Um, so uh, when you take derivatives with respect to W, you have to be very careful, right? Because you're taking derivatives with respect to the vectors. So uh, uh, again, I, I'm not going to do all the algebra. I'm going to show you what uh, it looks like. So uh, here are the answers. So when you take the U.S. with respect to W, you actually get a linear system of equations that looks as follows. Phi transpose phi W equal phi transpose T. W are the unknown uh, coefficients in your regression function. T are the values of the target at the training points, and phi is what's called the design matrix. And I want you to take an extremely good look because this design matrix is sort of universal in every type of machine learning algorithm. Okay, it's universal. Uh, so, uh, uh, so I remind you, x1 to xn are my training data points, and I have functions from phi zero to phi m minus one here. So I have, let's say, m basis functions. So if you look at each row of the matrix phi, what is there visually that will remind you so you can write it on your own? So every row of the matrix phi contains what? What is the identifier of every row? The data points. So this is data point x1, this data, so you put basically one data point on every row, all right? And uh, uh, so that's the data points. And, uh, uh, and every column, the identifier is basically a, a basis function, okay? So if you remember one of those, that basically each data point, you have to put it on every row, this is sort of standard now, all right? Uh, then you will know that uh, the columns, they have to correspond to each of the basis functions. Now, uh, there are two uh, sort of uh, vector 
uh, vectors that come out of this uh, design matrix, uh, uh, input design matrix phi, okay? And uh, I think in the literature, uh, people have been confused with uh, the Greek, Greek letters phi because obviously there are two of those. Did you know that? What's the name? Well, there are two Greek letters for phi. So one of them is, uh, let's look here. It says uh, phi equal this phi 0, phi 1, phi m mu minus 1. Can you tell me what those calligraphic phi's are? What's the dimension of each of those? N, right? The dimension of each of those is N. And also you can actually see, uh, you can write phi transpose as phi of x1, phi of x2, phi of x n. So if you take uh, the transpose, basically this will become uh, a row, this will become another row. And what's the dimensionality of each of those? N, the number of basis functions. Okay, so two uh, distinct representations. Uh, one uh, that the, the vectors are in Rn, and another one where the vectors are for phi transpose that they are in, uh, uh, in uh, Rn. Okay, and both of them basically are essential if you want to do uh, uh, manipulations and also geometric interpretation of this type of equations. Okay, so. Um, what you get here is basically phi transpose phi w equal phi transpose t. So this is a universal um, uh, phi transpose phi is a very well posed matrix. Uh, and uh, 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 so, it, you know, what you get is basically what's called in the literature the uh, Moore Penrose pseudo inverse uh, that looks like that. Okay? So the OMLE estimate is, is what you see there. And I have written the phi transpose phi explicitly in terms of the basis functions phi, and the same thing for phi transpose t. So effectively, uh, this came, when you take derivatives with respect to w, you get this, right? And then uh, if you write your phi matrix like that, you can easily verify that this summation is equal to that, and this summation is equal to that, okay? So this is uh, ordinary these squares, right? I want you to memorize it. Um, uh, so when you see it, uh, you know what it is and what potential uh, difficulties you may have. And uh, similarly, if you take derivatives with respect to beta, I already gave you the expression. Uh, what you get is, uh, you basically get that this is like a sample variance uh, uh, from the target values uh, of, the of the result that the regression function gives you at each of the training points uh, except. And again, uh, this is uh, a biased estimate. It underestimates uh, the true variance in your model. This is the slide that I was mentioning about uh, uh, convexity, so you may want to read it. The nice thing is this mean square error, right? Uh, it's a convex function, has a unique MLE estimate, and this is very nice, okay? And that unique MLE estimate, it only happens if you use uh, the mean square error, if you use um, you know, uh, absolute norm, for example, and I will show you or the, you know, some other type of models, uh, then you may be in trouble, okay? All right, now what I want to, uh, to uh, start throwing uh, little things out of uh, nowhere so that uh, you can uh, see something new, so you don't get bored from this lecture, is, so the MLE estimate, uh, uh, you know, we have an analytical expression fit, right? So there is, uh, this is it, that's it, okay? But there is a, a, a nice way that uh, in the context of MLE and other point estimates, and of course, much more important calculations, to compute uh, the uh, MLE estimate of W, and I remind you, the MLE estimate of W minimizes this error, this error function, okay? So there is a calculation of this that is sequential in nature. So imagine that somebody throws you uh, uh, thousands of data points. Do you really need uh, to actually go and compute this thing for thousands of data points to compute the MLE estimate? Is that really needed? I mean, maybe after 10 points, your MLE estimate is almost perfect. So the way to do this, all right, is uh, to do uh, using stochastic 
uh, uh, optimization. And uh, you see here the standard formula for doing um, uh, online learning. And I write the formula for you. The, you. It's iterative. You go from iteration tau to tau plus one. Uh, eta is what is called a learning rate that you have to play with. And this is the gradient of the, uh, uh, of the error function. But the gradient evaluated only at point uh, except. OK? So there is no summation over data points here. It's one data point at a time. All right? So if you take the gradient, you can see 2 and 2 cancel, and you get t minus w transpose p, and then times p of x n. OK? And uh, so this method is called the least mean squares error, uh, you know. Uh, and uh, for those who have um, or are using stochastic optimization, they know it's sort of a universal way to minimize complex implicit functions when you have a lots of data sets. And actually, I wanted to throw uh, some of one of your former problems for you to do an MLE estimation this way. So maybe um, in the next homework, we will throw something that you have to implement this. Just one line, OK? Um, all right, extremely effective. One data point at a time, and uh, without having to go through all the data points, uh, there is a very high chance that you will converge uh, way earlier than combining everything on, uh, and solving the least squares matrix problem. All right. Uh, so we, since we talk about MLE, we said the least mean square, the, this uh, quadratic error, the L2 error, it's a convex function, has a, a unique minimum. Uh, but there is an issue. The issue is actually the following. Imagine that at a given xn, Right? The value of Tn that I give you is completely wrong, out of reality. So here what you have is you have T minus W transpose phi squared. So you have something that's very big, and you take quadratic. You take a power of 2. So the error amplifies, and then you have to adjust W accordingly. So basically, if you have an outlier, right? if one of your target values is way wrong, this model will actually move you towards the outlier simply because it penalizes. This error is going to be it's quadratic, it's significant. So you may want to play with other error functions that sort of they're uh, less uh, prone to this outlier problem. And those functions, I have uh, two examples here. One, uh, uh, there is a lot on this slide. Okay, So uh, it's all basically, if, since we're doing a probabilistic modeling at this point, is all how does the likelihood will look like? And uh, uh, look now on, on, on this problem and tell me, so this is the Laplace, uh, uh, the Laplace distribution. So you notice the likelihood is what? So when you take the log of the likelihood here, what do you get? You get absolute values. Right? You don't get quadratics. You get absolute values. And um, let's look at. Uh, Again, there's way too much information on this slide. Let's look uh, in here, OK? And uh, uh, think of R being uh, t minus y, all right? This R that you see here is t minus y. So can you extrapolate what this is all about? It says if, if uh, I'm sorry, wrong. What am I talking about? Uh, Uh, so R is so uh, uh, R is uh, a location, okay, uh, and it says if the location is less than delta, do what? And then if R is greater than delta, do something else. So what's co going on here? I don't know if in the next plot it doesn't give me a plot. Let me see. Oh, here it is. All right. So look at that plot and tell me exactly what we do. Conceptually, again, the details are in the slides. We don't need them. Um, so um, so this is the L2 uh, uh, error uh, uh, function, right? The quadratic, the mean square 
you know, uh, error that we have seen. Uh, this is the L1, the absolute value we get from Laplace, and this is this approximation. So what is this approximation uh, doing? It says for the values that they are up to some distance delta, uh, how does the error vary? How? It varies quadratically. And you are concerned because of outliers, if that distance is, you know, if that value, right, if t minus the regression function, they are far away from each other. And then you say, if that case, actually, you know what? Um, uh, the main contribution is absolute value minus some correction. And you need that correction because you want to make uh, the two pieces that you put together, you want them to match. And you want them to match not only by the value, but also in the slope. So at distance delta, you notice the slope is also the, the you know, uh, uh, matches, OK? Uh, so this is what's called the Hubert loss function, all right? Uh, in some sense, all right, this looks very complicated, but it's more desirable than using the absolute value for the error function, because when you use the absolute value, you cannot really do a gradient optimization. I mean, the absolute value can be equal to this or equal to minus that. Cannot differentiate that, but this function is differentiable, right? So this is, it uh, sort of takes the benefits of the quadratic loss function and the absolute loss function, and combining the two things together still allows you to use uh, uh, gradient optimization methods. So let's see what happens and, and, and to see the results here. What you see here are the training data points. And you see a bunch of outliers, right? So these are not for decoration. These are outlier points on the bottom, OK? So uh, uh, let's see what happens here. The least squares solution has shifted way towards the outliers. The other things, the uh, Laplace approximation or using student T, all right? Uh, similar form, basically. They're very robust to outliers, so they, they're very close to the uh, the bulk of the data. And similarly here, for the Hubert loss, this is what you get with these squares. And the Hubert loss is very robust to outliers. It basically says, you know, I don't need this box, OK? Uh, and you can say, but I can do this as a user, right? I can look. No, you cannot, because this is a regression problem in one dimension. If it was a regression problem, in fact, was in 20 dimensions, you won't be able to say this is, you know, an outlier. It's not so, I mean, there are things to do, right? You can do some pre-processing of the data, but this type of uh, methodologies allow you to sort of automate this process. All right. So um, in, in uh, so we, we talked about, um, uh, you know, uh, least squares, and then I, I mentioned regularized least squares, right? We added one half of lambda times the norm of W squared. Can we probabilistically introduce now some sort of regularization? OK? So let's uh, uh, see what the idea is. OK? So, uh, so before I give you the probabilistic version, I, I remind you here what uh, the regularized least squares was. OK? So this is the uh, mean square error. And then we add this regularization uh, term. And the only thing that happens is uh, I'm reading, I'm writing this in terms of the design matrix phi. So instead of carrying it transpose phi inverse, now we have plus lambda times uh, uh, a diagonal unit matrix, right? So this is what you see here. It's uh, uh, what uh, goes with the name Ritz regression, OK? So this is regularized these squares, OK? So if you compute this W, and you don't want to do anything further probabilistically, you can actually uh, use the point estimate for W in the likelihood and do predictions using this point estimate. And that's what people refer to as uh, uh, Ritz re regression. So the question now is, uh, can we get this Ritz regression in some sort of probabilistic setting? OK. Uh, let me see if I can bypass this for now, and I'll, I'll show you. Uh, how we get the rich regression. Unless this comes to be 10 lectures down the road. Yeah, actually it is uh, 20 slides down the road. So can you guys tell me 
uh, how we're going to get uh, this sort of regularization uh, probabilistically. What we need to do. We'll talk on this, doesn't seem today, but we'll talk on this on Thursday, but how uh, uh, we will be able to go from an MLE estimate that is the same as least squares to a regularized estimate that looks like that. What is the uh, primary idea here? Yeah, but uh, what do we need to do probabilistically before we become Bayesian? Probabilistically, you remember, we got the MLE estimate by having a likelihood model, right? So it's not a likelihood. We have to go to a map estimate. And to go to a map estimate, we need a, what type of thing? We need a prior for W, all right? So that regularization term will come from a prior model. And then when we combine them to compute the map estimate, then we will, uh, you have to trust me, it's about 50 slides, or not 50 slides, 20 slides down the road, we're going to get basically the same identical rich regression model. OK? And we will see it, OK? Uh, somehow, I don't want to start jumping the slides because there may be something uh, that is uh, important. Uh, so uh, what is important here, all right, I threw the slides in because we're going to spend some time talking about uh, lasso regression on uh, forthcoming lectures. So what I have for you here is I have different sorts of regularization. Uh, so this is our standard mean square error, um, uh, least squares uh, estimate, right? And then we add some regularization. Uh, we have m coefficients. And um, uh, I put some exponent there, q, to show you that if you play with q, you actually get uh, 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 different sort of uh, uh, forms for this regularizer uh, functional, if you like. And I plot this for q equal to 2, q equal to 1. Uh, and I'm actually interested on uh, this q equal to 1, the way it looks like, all right? Uh, because this has some uh, interesting, uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, attributes, OK? So um, and these are the interesting attributes. So what I have is. Um, uh, think of these blue curves being contours uh, of the quadratic uh, error function that you minimize to get the MLE estimate. You remember is one half of the target values minus W transpose P. It's a quadratic function. So you get these circles, and I plot them in W1, W2. OK? Uh, and, uh, and then uh, think of a regularizer that minimizes basically W squared all right, uh, the regularizer basically for q equal to 2, you get the circles. All right, so this will uh, correspond to our standard rich regression type of uh, model. And then think another setup where you have uh, this uh, mean square error exactly as before, but now uh, the regularizer is uh, uh, a lasso regularizer corresponding to q equal to 1. So here I have only the absolute value of this coefficients. And uh, uh, the derivation is in the nodes, OK? When you try to add a regularization on, uh, on uh, this form, all right? So you say minimize this plus that, OK? You can actually show, all right? You can actually, I don't know if it's written. Yes. So you can actually show that this problem, all right? This problem is the same mathematically as to minimize this with this constraint, where uh, the theta value is some appropriate value to be computed. You can show the derivation is on the slide that follows that doing a minimization of this augmented functional that involves the mean square error plus the regularizer, it's equivalent to uh, doing a minimization of the first term with a constraint that is the regularizer having a value less than some value eta. OK? You have to trust me. The derivation has to do with uh, the Ken Tucker conditions for how you do optimization of the constraints. And it's given on the next slide. And if we go through it, it will take us to another animal. All right? We don't want to do that today. Uh, you trust me that uh, we want, in both cases, to minimize this function here all right, with the constraints that were inside this domain. 
So looking at the two pictures, uh, you see something interesting. In the case with laser regularizer, what do you see happen? Say again? So we see here in this particular case that one of the coefficients w1 is dropped to 0. So Lasso regularizer is to sparse. Okay? When actually we do the full Bayesian regression model, I'm going to try to extend this. So you will see this in, uh, in action on uh, how effective dimensions in the model are being picked up. But literally, the key ingredient is that effectively, uh, because of the shape of this constraint for q equal to 1, uh, uh, some of the w's are dropped to 0. And which w's are dropped to 0, we will discuss it uh, when we complete basic, uh, the Bayesian analysis. I'm going to uh, show you that in, uh, in, uh, in some detail. All right. We don't care about this. It's like an exercise. You guys can read it. All right. Um, um, I, I only have five minutes on uh, of this, and it is really not, uh, 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 you know, I was, I cut it and pasted this from another lecture. I was debating if I should bring it to this first lecture on regression. And I realized, you know, if you read books on statistical learning, the first topic you're going to learn before you do regression is really the bias variance decomposition. So I felt that uh, maybe we need to throw the idea um, uh, uh, here on the air, OK? So let me see. Uh, I know you're going to read everything, right, I trust. Uh, don't pay attention. It says 64 slides. You know what? But I can take the 64 slides and compress them to two pages. Readers digest. And actually, you know, in a lot of universities, what uh, students are being asked to do, have you noticed, especially in computer science courses, there's always a scribe that they say, you write the, the lectures today and then you distribute them next week. And you do this the following week. And that requires uniformity in standards, which would be maybe an exercise we need to do. I mean, go to you know any university you will see in all the classes they have a, a student assigned randomly to scribe the notes, okay? So that way you don't fill it 64 pages because it's not, all right? It's four pages. Sh we should try this, right? <laughs> all right. So uh, uh, let me. Uh, I, I only have a few minutes, okay? And we'll come back to this. It will take us no more than five minutes to discuss and give you what the idea is. We have. We, were, uh, we had introduced the regression loss function, right, the quadratic function, and we said that the, the optimal solution, the regression function, is basically the expected value of the target uh, uh, given x. And one of the things that uh, I, I uh, in the derivation, you remember this is the expected loss function, the expected loss, and the expectation was with respect to the joint distribution of x and t. So when uh, uh, you do some algebra, right, the, uh, this expected loss can take this form here, OK? Uh, there is, uh, literally, there is uh, no much uh, uh, calculation. Actually, what the calculation is, uh, in, in here, you have to uh, add and subtract this expectation, then expand the square, and then you get these two terms, and then the third term cancels out, OK? So, um, so, uh, all right, so, uh, so this function here that I have, it's an acronym basically for uh, this uh, expectation of t given x, all right, so I don't have to carry it all the time. So what we want to do is uh, we want to basically uh, repeat this calculation over a, a, a different set of data, all right? This is sort of in a frequent testing, you know, with a frequentist point of view. Um, uh, we want to run this learning algorithm and find the optimal regression function, but we want somehow to repeat this calculation for different so sorts of data D and figure out what is the variation that we get in the predictions of the regression function as we go across these data sets D. I remind you, in a Bayesian setting, there's only one data set. All right. So when, when I gave you uh, uh, this, right, there's no data sets here. This is a much more general result. But uh, when we try to do fitting in Bayesian setting, we say here are the data set on the training points. 
um, do whatever and, and start doing predictions. What I want to do now is assume that I have a sequence of data sets, right? D1, D2, etc. And I want to know what is the variability that I get when I minimize the loss functions when I change the data sets D. So this is, I want to see what is happening over an ensemble of data sets. Uh, I am going to actually give you the formula because it's 145. So when you try to expand and, uh, and you compute the averages over uh, a collection of data sets, you get three terms in the expected loss function. One uh, term, basically, there's nothing you can do about. There's nothing about the regression. You know, there's nothing you can do, right, is, is the noise. One term is the bias square term. And another term is um, the, the variance. So basically, what uh, we'll briefly discuss on, um, on uh, Thursday when we start is that in all learning algorithms, that somehow you have a competition between the bias term and the variance term. So when you try to, complex, to, to select the complexity of the model, it's trying effectively to balance uh, the uh, contribution of each of these terms. So we will come back on this, um, see the derivation again, and, uh, and uh, then I think we'll be ready to do Bayesian analysis uh, on Thursday. All right, see you then. <laughs>